Thank you. All righty. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. I hope you had a chance to um, get, grab something to eat either during the break that we just had or during the presentation with Dr. Cook. Um, I'm really glad that we added back into our schedule that lunchtime uh, session, and I'm really glad I had a chance to listen to, to her. I think she was um, a really great, a great person to have over lunch today. So on to our next session. When we first started thinking about um, some of what we wanted for the sessions today, we really thought we wanted something that would focus on some aspect of collection development. We knew that our next speaker had experience with that, as well as having presented nationally on LGBTQ issues. Ellsworth Carmen is the director of the Iowa City Public Library, and I really liked his description of himself as being focused on hospitality and creating a sense of belonging. And I think that's a great description of what a librarian can be. So thank you, Ellsworth, for being with us today, and welcome to ILOC. Thank you so much, Becky. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to, to have a chance to, to speak about something that I care very deeply about. Um, I, like you said, I have a background in public libraries. Um, sort of full disclosure, it's been a few years since I've worked directly with collection development. I still oversee it as a director, but um, but I haven't been actually, you know, making Baker Taylor carts for a, a number of years. But I've kept up with it. It's something I really feel passionately about, um, and I'm I'm looking forward to sharing sharing what I know. Um, let's see. And I want to start just by mentioning. Um, Anything I say in this session is completely my own opinion. I'm not speaking for Iowa City Public Library. I'm not speaking for ILA. Um, I'm not speaking for anybody but myself. Um, I am intending to use all language that I use in an affirming way. When you're talking about LGBTQ kind of stuff, there are all different tolerances for words that you use. I use the word queer a lot. That's something I feel comfortable with and my community um, seems to, to be okay with. Um, if something you know rings untrue to your ear, please know that I'm using it in good faith and don't hesitate to follow up with me after the session to say, hey, just so you know, that might be offensive to somebody. Um, and I'm, I'm always learning and always eager to know more. Um, usually in this kind of session, I like to do a lot of participation. So lots of small group conversations, breakouts, direct feedback. Um, Zoom makes that a little bit more complicated. So what I'm gonna try to do is move through the material relatively swiftly and leave us some time at the end to have dialogue um, as much as we can. If you have questions that are very time specific or need immediate response, I think Samantha and Becky are doing some monitoring there through chat, but um, Otherwise, if you want to make a note and we can address at the end, we'll try to do that. Um, we'll kind of start by working through some terms and definitions, talking about why inclusive collections matter, um, talking about how to use them, how to promote them, how to defend them. Um, and then assuming we have time, we'll go through some, some of the titles that I've had my eye on recently um, that, that might be recommendations for starting that to build those collections. So first of all, um, let's just break down what we're talking about here. Um, when I say LGBTQIA inclusive, I mean lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer or questioning, asexual, um, and intersex inclusive. So that could be in written by um, an author who comes from those communities, written about characters from those communities. Um, and in my mind, an inclusive collection has this content throughout the entire collection. Um, I think there was a, a short moment in time where a lot of libraries used a model of having a small, um, it was probably at that time called lesbian and gay section, where any book that touched these topics would be um, in its own little section. Um, and that felt like best practice. I think the field has evolved a little bit and we know that uh, browsability and findability is key. Um, so really, when I say inclusive, I'm talking about 
cookbooks by out lesbian chefs and bisexual YA graphic novels, picture books with queer parents, um, you know, all of that sort of just entrenched throughout the whole library. And the reason that matters, um, there are multiple reasons. Representation is important. We know this for all types of identities. Um, queer people in the community deserve to see themselves in your materials. Not people who aren't queer also deserve to see queer people. Um, we know that demand feeds production. So the more libraries that are buying these materials, the more publishers will put out. Um, and seeing queerness um, in books is a great way just to sort of normalize this, make it part of the community dialogue. Um, and a couple sort of hidden reasons that I like to bring up, um, because I know I know friends and family members who do these things, having queer materials on the shelves can help donors decide where to donate. I think it's, it's fairly common for somebody to say, I care about an issue, I'm going to explore um, how this library represents me and my family before I decide if I want to support it. Um, also, taking a look at library collections can be a great way for folks to feel out a community before deciding if it could be a fit for them. So maybe you are looking, you're relocating for a job. That's something that people may do to see what, um, am I going to be, am I going to find community as a queer person? Am I represented? Is this, am I, am I uh, part of what's going on in this community. And I know those things don't always rise to the top of our thoughts when we're selecting materials, but um, in, in this area, I really think it's critical. Imagine yourself um, moving to Iowa from, from maybe a bigger city. If you were a trans woman and you thought, okay, it's a medium-sized city, it, it looks pretty friendly, um, but the library, when I search for transgender fiction at the library, there's nothing. I, you know, that might feel like an indicator. Um, and don't forget that queer people are everywhere. Um, even if it feels like your community doesn't have anybody who's out or who's uh, actively talking about being queer, um, probably everybody in this room actively serves, you know, numerous queer folks. Um, and you can never guess who's going to want these materials and why. Um, so it, I think the default is just best to say, let's let's bring them in, let's include them, and and see what we can do with them. So, so I'm relatively new to Iowa. I've lived here um, five years, six years, and I know that around the state we have all different kinds of communities. So we've got you know larger cities that that are very um, very much more inclusive by nature. Lots of small towns. So. Um, when you hear me talking about things like this, don't despair if it feels like some of the suggestions are, are too big of steps. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but remember, you have a lot of skills in scaling services. We hear about cool stuff all the time and we make it work where we are. This is the same deal. I would start when you're thinking about inclusive collections by just exploring what you already have. Um, you could do a really basic collection audit. Um, you could even just do some some key catalog searches and try to figure out where are you, um, what's your base level with queer content. And if you find, you may find you've got quite a bit of queer fiction, but, you know, not very much nonfiction or things like that. That's all great. The more you know, the better you can get. So do that sort of holistic um, assessment of what you've got. And that could be very complex or very simple. And then just start to make a plan. As library people, we project manage all the time. So think about how, what's my goal? How am I gonna get there? Don't try to just fix it with a giant book order. You know, you need to be a little more strategic. Um, and part of that is gonna be finding resources that you like um, to evaluate potential purchases. Um, just because the material is queer doesn't mean it's going to fit in your collection and it doesn't mean it's going to be quality um, just like every every other genre and every other topic there are great books and there are terrible books um it used to be a really big part of this presentation to talk about where you can find reviews um luckily we're not there at that point anymore i'll talk a little bit about that um, in a second but um you really 
when you're starting out, well, think about your community and think about what's going to work the best and focus on that. Um, one easy way to do it, if you, you know, maybe you're, you're a little overwhelmed with other projects, things like that, you could start with just an awards list um, or rainbow awards or, or equivalent and just say, okay, we're just going to make sure that we've got all these current award winners. Um, even something as small as that is going to get you started. Um, like I said before, it used to be a major hurdle to find reviews of, of queer material. Um, when I became a librarian about 15 years ago, um, not even all the major publishing sources would review um, LGBT content, especially the more, um, the less mainstream stuff. Um, but we're really lucky now, really almost everybody is covering it. Um, when I was preparing for this presentation, I, I was Googling a couple different um, award lists. And at this point, um, you know, Oprah has a best LGBT book list. Good Housekeeping Magazine puts one out. Reddit, like everybody, everybody's doing it, which is great. Again, we want that representation. We want to see these things just um, everywhere that, that we have materials. Um, a key to this, though, is finding what works for you. So you might find an exceptional um, independent blogger who reviews all new queer content. That's great, um, unless what your community needs um, doesn't align with that. Maybe you need somebody who specializes more in you know, the nonfiction side of things or a different age group. Uh, it's just gonna take some kind of poking around to figure out what, what works for you and, and your governance and your community. So I listed just a few examples of these easier um, places to get recommendations for award winners. Um, Stonewall, the Bisexual Book Awards, Bill Whitehead, which is an author award, um, Lambda. There are just a number of pretty rock solid places to go. Um, and it can be a real benefit to have that award seal on the book too when you're talking to people about why you might be, why you might be growing these collections. Um, but when you, I would say when you do find those sources that resonate, um, it can just be a really great addition to what you're already doing in collection development. But I say I'm not going to give my specifics, but I do like to share this one, um, one source. There's a, a small educational library called the Cooperative Children's Book Center, which is part of the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Education. Um, and the staff do a lot of work around diversity statistics and making um, themed lists and things like that to be used by educators and librarians. Um, they publish a best of list um, every year of sort of all genres, but online they have some really exceptional LGBT inclusive youth material lists that, that I feel are, are strong enough that somebody who was just starting out and building a queer collection could essentially take that list and order it wholesale. Um, this is just a, a phenomenally professional, really skilled group of librarians doing the work at CCBC. And um, it's a, a great place to, to take a look for, for this kind of material, but also um, they, they cover a lot of ground. So it's a good, a good place to explore. Um, I get a question a lot from folks about where where queer books should go in their collections. And you you can still find libraries that have LGBT sections. Um, I think for some places that works all right. We see that in bookstores as well. But just like I feel strongly about these materials being, you know, in every part of your collection, they literally, I think, should pepper the shelves um, to and my emphasis would be on findability there. Um, we, we want them to be everywhere folks are looking for materials. And it could be easy to think about having a good ILL system or a really user-friendly request a title kind of system could take the place of, of buying a bunch of materials. But I, I don't think that's good enough. I think you need to get the materials, have them on site, ready to be found, ready to be checked out. Um, a huge part of this is read some of them. 
um, get familiar with titles so that you've got some that you can hand sell. Um, and when you do recommend them, I would really try to avoid giving um, warnings about content. If somebody said, you know, I would love a cozy mystery with a little side of romance, um, but not a lot of violence. If you've got one with a lesbian relationship, include it in your suggestions. You don't need to include it with like a, a subtle like, well, this one has a lesbian romance. No, give the people what they want and you know, give them some diversity um, and don't, don't um, assume that folks are going to have an issue with it. I think it's really important to include queer titles in as many displays as you can. Um, have them on your book lists, your themed reading lists. If you give away prize books, include queer content. Um, you Again, you want to vet these materials. You want to make sure that they fit in your collection and, and are going to appeal to your community. But there's um, we want to take away that any kind of special handling that maybe would have felt appropriate in the 80s um, or 90s. Um, and this is another polarizing issue. I know a lot of library people think, I just can't wait to put that sticker on the spine. Um, there are lots of pros, of pros and cons to stickering books. Um, and I'm, I think everybody in the room will know, I'm talking about genre stickers um, that the libraries use to identify usually just major genres, mystery, romance, um, true crime, that kind of stuff. And the advantage, the reason people do it is so that patrons can find things quickly. So they might know, oh, I love Western, so I look for the, the books with the cowboy boot on the back. Um, with queer content, I think it's sort of a double-edged sword. It might be great for a for some readers looking for these materials, but it also could um, be a deterrent for folks who um, maybe they they aren't out. Maybe they're um, maybe they don't want this to be the first thing that people see them reading um, in public. Um, it's it's a complex issue. It's sort of a an issue that every library has to grapple with. Um, my personal recommendation is not to sticker. I think it, um, I think it makes just the fact that it could make people reluctant to use those materials is enough of a deterrent not to do it. Um, if you are a stickering library, you know, go for it, see how it works, see if you get any feedback. Um, if you have the luxury of a, a very big budget for materials, you could always try um, duplicate ordering and and maybe stickering one and not stickering another and seeing if that makes a difference in your CERC. Um, I think it's always interesting if you can put out little little feelers like that to see um, do are people drawn to it or or does it make people reluctant to use the material. Um, in case anybody loves the stickers shown here, these are both Demco stickers. Uh, one is the retro version and one is the um, I guess non-retro contemporary version. Let's see. So let's talk about pushback for a minute. And I'm going to start talking about not super, super scary pushback, which is on the screen, but what about just a little bit of pushback? So you've done your work. You've found materials that, that work for your community you've brought them in, you and your staff are promoting them, you're putting them on displays, um, things are going well. And then someone comes in with a comment um, or a question or a, a challenge and says, this doesn't belong in our library. Um, so I wanna take a moment and remind folks again, these are just my opinions. Your board, your city managers, um, the other people who help administer your library may feel differently. But my opinion is um, in the moment when you receive that challenge or that comment, you want to stay very calm. Thank the patron for the comment. You know, as we always do, we appreciate your feedback. Um, don't commit to anything in the moment. I would not say we will reevaluate. I would not say we will consider removing it. I would not say 
anything about taking it to the board for consideration. I would simply say thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. Um, I appreciate your feedback and um, you know, maybe get their, their contact information if you would like. But um, if, and many of you I'm sure have challenge, um, challenge processes, which is great. Um, I think something that we wanna make sure not to do is give material challenges um, extra attention. I think the way that ICPL handles material challenges, and this this comes from before my time, um, is we treat them with like, like any other patron complaint or comment. Uh, we do not have separate paperwork. We do not have um, any kind of prescribed interview with the person making the comment. Um, we do not automatically take it to the board. We treat it just like we would anything else, uh, both on social media and, and in other venues. So if a person approaches us with a comment, um, we will note it, we will see um, what kind of follow-up they'd like. And most of the time, what we end up doing is sending some information about our selection policy um, and, and leave it at that. Um, if, so at the moment, you're gonna stay really calm. You're gonna be very professional. Um, you're going to thank them, but long-term, I think these are the important steps to think about. Making sure your staff know how to respond. So if you get a challenge and you're not there, um, you need to make sure everybody kind of has the, the same kind of response. Um, and again, you want that to be sort of a controlled, even keel. Um, don't get excited. Don't run to the shelves and start pulling other things. Um, my recommendation would be to develop and maintain a selection policy. If you don't have one, um, the state library can help. Um, ALA is gonna have great examples. You could ask your peer libraries um, to see theirs, um, but basically just define what you buy and why. Um, what, what are, what's the criteria for your materials? Um, it's also always a great idea to find community supporters. So proactively, before there's an issue, reach out to groups in your community that will understand why you need these materials and will be users of them. I think of groups like PFLAG and Gay Straight Alliances um, as really low hanging fruit for this, but also think about school librarians, um, local physicians or medical groups, um, scout leaders, adult caregivers of youth, um, just other groups that, that will come to bat for you and say, absolutely, we need these materials. Um, because you never know when you might need to reach out for an opinion um, to help balance things. If um, another important piece, if you do get something that you feel is an official challenge, however you define that, you'll want to report that to ALA. There's an easy way on the website to do that. Um, I probably were supposed to report them to ILA as well, um, but to those intellectual freedom groups. Um, and another um, tool I like to use in this situation is something that I call appreciative inquiry. Anytime I get um, something escalated to my level that somebody wants to talk about a material challenge, um, I just ask a lot of questions and not in a way that's disrespectful, um, in a way that I'm just trying to get to the core of the issue. But if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I, I, I think this book is offensive. It doesn't belong on your shelves. Um, it's, got, it's got some really inappropriate sex stuff in it. You could respond, Okay, uh, so you're reporting that, that you found this material offensive. Uh, what was the issue that bothered you? And they may answer and you can reframe that. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm understanding your concern is that there's a consensual sexual relationship in the book. And they may come back and say, no, that's not the issue. It's the, the issue is that it's, it's a lesbian relationship. And you can you know, continue to reframe and put it back to them and say, okay, so it's an issue because it's a consensual sexual relationship between two women. And sometimes just reframing it in a very factual way will help people sort of reground themselves and, and sort of walk away feeling like, yeah, maybe that's not such a big issue. Um, it doesn't always work. Um, 
I I like to try it because it can help us help both me and the patron get to um, a more grounded place. But um, but it doesn't always doesn't always do the trick. Um, there's a much more serious side to push back to, and and this next slide speaks to that. Um, depending on where in the state you're from, you might even recognize the um, the gentleman in the picture burning some books there. In addition to the soft feedback we might get, there's a, a chance that you're going to take on some serious, like put your agency at risk kind of feedback. Um, and that um, that can happen anywhere. I think you're more prone to it in more conservative communities, but um, it's something that really can, can rise up um, when it's least expected. And I think, again, you know, you're going to want to use your tools. You know, hopefully you've got that selection policy. You've talked to your board about the importance of these materials. You're going to have your stats about how how these are used um, in the community. They're, how, you know, they're checked out, everything like that. Um, I would say if you have a legal partner at your library, whether that's your state, um, your, your city attorney, other things like that, you'll want to bring them in. Um, and again, reach out to State Library ALA, stay focused, be professional, keep records. But I mainly bring this issue up because I think it can feel um, really isolating when something is attacked at your library. This is a place that we, um, you know, we're doing our best. We're really working hard to serve the community and it can be such a blow to, to feel like people in the community are, are reaching out and saying that, that this work is not valid and that you're you're doing harm, um, and some of us are in communities where we don't need to worry about this, but but others are not. Um, I think we just need to recognize um, that that it can happen, and that that doesn't mean that it's worth um, not not working towards inclusion and things like that. But um, I mean, we know from some of our peer libraries in the recent past that, um, that things can escalate very quickly. Often they pass relatively quickly as well, but in those um, those days or weeks of turmoil, that's not a very comforting fact that it's gonna, it'll be over at some point. Um, I think finding those community partners, having people who will help rally with you to say, um, you burned those books, but we're gonna buy them again. Um, and just sort of keep normalizing um, as much as you can. We'll help you get through it. I, I also always recommend reach out to people. If you are in the middle of a crisis like this or you feel like you're at the beginning of it, um, you know, call a bigger library. Call a library that you think may have dealt with this um, and sort of just get some, some hand-holding around how to approach it. Um, it's easy to get sort of tangled up in your own head around this stuff. So don't um, don't let it isolate you. Um, remember you're doing good work, you're working hard for your community um, and, and you're making progress. So that's the important thing. Um, if you have a board or a city administration that does not support inclusive collections, that's a different presentation. You're, you're facing a different mountain um, at that point. Um, and I think that you can overcome it, but we're not gonna be able to cover it in the next half an hour. Um, and I, I think um, it's sort of, sort of like looking at this serious pushback. Um, you may be in a community that you're thinking, it's just, I just can't do it. There's, there's too much against me to, um, to try to diversify. I'm afraid that if I bring in even a few titles, um, I will, I'll be putting my agency at risk. I'll be putting, putting my job at risk. Trust yourself. You know your community, you know your library. Um, don't stay, you know, little progress is still good progress. So it's okay if you hear about, you know, New York Public Library doing some awesome, awesome queer activity um, and and you can't do it. Just keep doing, keep fighting the fight, and and you're going to get closer than you were before. Um, it's 
you know, having the intent to to get more inclusive is, is also very important. Um, so I wanted to bring in a few examples of books that kind of speak to the availability of stuff for every level here, because I think it's easy to think about, okay, there's a lot of good LGBT adult fiction um, and things like that. But really, truly, you're going to be able to find stuff that, that belongs in each part of your um, collection. So I, I just pulled out a few um, books at different levels. Um, most of these are newer. Um, a few of them aren't, but but almost all of them would be very easy to find. Um, starting out with board books, so looking at stuff for the very young. Um, Our Rainbow was an award winner from, I think, 2020 um, that basically just goes through what is the rainbow flag, what do the colors mean, um, sort of a celebratory easy board book um, fits in everywhere. Mommy, Mama, and Me is is similar. It's just a, a very pleasant um, story, a toddler with two moms. There's a companion book um, with two dads. Um, things like this are just going to, for most of us, fit very easily into what we're already doing um, and are great to have on hand, um, both for staff to use in story times, programs, things like that, but also more importantly, just for folks to check out. Um, moving up just a little bit, thinking about picture books. Um, this is a part this genre has exploded. Um, you're going to find tons of LGBT inclusive picture books available, depending on what you're looking for. Um, Poppy Daddy and Riley is, um, is, is kind of a, a sweet story about, um, Riley gets asked which of her dads is her real dad and sort of how she reconciles with that, um, because she loves them both and things like that. Um, Hips on the Drag Queen go swish, swish, swish. This is a, there's an element of novelty to books like this, but I think that, um, that if you can, if you can work them into your collection, the more the better. Um, this one's really fun for programming. It's kind of like the wheels on the bus, but with, um, with drag queen components to it. Um, and, and that one was written by, um, a founder of Drag Queen Story Hour, um, and I know we've used it here a few times and, and it's been, been well received. Uh, moving up a little bit to juvenile fiction. Um, these are just a couple examples of, again, that sort of very common themes, just queer characters. Um, George is about a, a, a girl um, who's seen by the rest of the world as a boy. Um, she kind of makes a scheme that if if she can play Charlotte in her school's production of um, Charlotte's Web, it's going to solve her problems. Um, but really relatable for those middle grades. Uh, totally Joe as well. That's a little bit of an older one. Um, James Howe is a, an author that we probably all have in our collection about a, a young uh, sixth grader who's, I'm sorry, seventh grader who's coming out in his experience. One thing that I like about Totally Joe is it's, uh, very positive. It doesn't. It doesn't have a lot of strife. It doesn't have a lot of angst. It. Um, it's just sort of a story about a young a young boy coming out and, and his experience with his social circle. Juvenile nonfiction has also gotten a lot stronger. Um, I. I think it's important not to focus too much on. Um, the sexuality parts of LGBT issues, um, especially if you just are growing a collection. But I include sex as a funny word um, because I think it's one one of the best examples of kind of a health and sexuality book that doesn't overtly talk a lot about queer issues, but it it's also really non-binary. So it doesn't talk about specific body parts equating to a gender. Um, and that's a, that's a really refreshing take on something that you could give to a, a, a child or a, a middle grade student who is interested in the topic, but doesn't need the, the same old binary um, representation that we've had forever. Um, viral, I think, is just an example of um, sort of an updated look at the AIDS crisis um, and 
covers it in a in a really compassionate but factual way. The when I was growing up, books about AIDS, the few books for younger readers about AIDS were extremely negative, um, still really kind of built on bias and misinformation. And this is much more, um, talks more about community, talks more about um, emotional, financial impacts, just a much more holistic look. And I think that we've seen that blossom in nonfiction for younger readers. Um, fairly recently. Um, and that's a, it's great to replace any of that older stuff you might still have on the shelves. Um, looking at YA again, you're not going to need any help finding great YA uh, queer content. Um, this was one of the places that I feel like it grew the most quickly um, when it was becoming more, um, more prevalent in, in publishing. Um, the only black girls in town is um, is a really great one, sort of for intersectionality. It's got talk, you know, it's it's got um, some socioeconomic, some racial dynamics, some queer dynamics. Um, it's about a teen who lives in a, a tourist town in California. They're the only black family there. Um, she has two dads, and then. A, um, a new family comes into town who is also black and how the girls form a friendship and, and what that sort of brings up and brings out. Um, again, really nice because it's more about intersectionality of topics than just straight up focusing on a sexuality issue. Um, and drum roll please um, is a, a really sweet middle school level book about a girl who goes to um, music camp and her sort of growing relationships with, with different people that she meets there, while at the same time she grapples with um, her parents' divorce. Um, so both of these, I think, are great examples of telling a story bigger than just, um, just a same-sex romance. Why nonfiction is um, another one you'll have a lot to pick from. Um, I, I chose being jazz to include here, um, and I think there's a, a subgenre in nonfiction that are similar to this book. Um, if anybody's not familiar with Chaz Jennings, um, she's a sort of pop, pop media person. She's, she's been um, in the media since she was about five and started transitioning. Barbara Walters did an interview with her when she was very young, and she sort of stayed in and out of, of the limelight since then. Um, Being Jazz talks about her transition as a teen, um, and it's a great resource. And like I said, there are a number of others that remind me of it, but I think one thing to note is many of these nonfiction materials highlight transgender youth who come from places of extreme privilege. Um, and many of them tell a story of sort of I, this is how my identity evolved. This is, um, this here's my sort of litany of medical transition, social transition. And I think it's important to try to find resources that also speak to other experiences. Um, not every, not every transgender youth is going to have that experience like jazz where you you do get to really pursue that transition at a at a young age um and i think it, it's great to see those they could be very aspirational but it's also important for youth to see other stories as well um i included aaron andrews some assembly required um this is about a trans teen from um oklahoma and kind of where where he found support and what what that how he came about to to sort of reconcile his identity um, and move forward towards adulthood um, this one I think is is very funny and kind of quirky others um, Aaron the author has a history of being in beauty pageants and things like that so there are just sort of some some really um, tenderly handled um, 
transition related things in it. Um, and like I said before, there's tons of, of teen material available. Um, I think having a mix of these sort of um, well-known characters, but also bringing in some some other stories. There are some great anthologies and things that talk more about um, youth who have to wait a little bit longer to transition um, or who may be in environments that are less supportive. Um, adult fiction is, um, there, there's a lot to pick from. I, I chose these two examples um, because I think they're both, um, they, they sort of speak to subgenres within within the queer canon. Um, All My Mother's Lovers are about a so almost estranged adult daughter who's a lesbian who goes back home after her mother's death and then works through some of the things about her mother's life that she hadn't known before and um, how that sort of family secret idea and um, the main character's identity weave together to tell, tell a story. This one I think could be, it, the writing is phenomenal. It really could be read by, by anybody looking for a good story. Um, a Beautiful Crime is another one that I think is perfect for that. Um, just include it in, when we're talking about mysteries um, and action books, it, um, it's kind of a dark mystery. Um, it's about some con artists who are newly in a romantic relationship and their their capers uh, sort of an international crime spree. Um, but the relationship part is is just you know sort of a sub part of the story. It's there's a lot going on in there that's going to appeal to readers beyond just the the queer identity. Um, and I think that can be such a nice entry point for. For, for people building these collections um, and people using these collections. Um, it, neither of these would be out of place on, on your adult, adult displays. Adult nonfiction, this is one of the places that queer stuff has been around the longest. Um, these are both award-winning titles from very recently. Um, she, He, They, Me um, is sort of looks at gender norms and, and conventions from around the world and sort of makes the point that there are many, many ways that cultures have defined gender and and used gender um, as part of the culture. And that both helps us understand the importance of it, but also sort of the, the not importance of it, that it's that there's so much more to our cultures than these binaries that many of us have created. Um, and How We Fight for Our Lives, an award winner by um, uh, African-American gay author, um, kind of a coming, coming of age memoir. Um, it's, it's told in vignettes and it's very readable. I think this would be ideal for book clubs. Um, it, um, you, you could also parcel out parts of it as um, I mean, they would almost stand as sort of independent short stories, but it's just a really, um, really fresh new voice um, and could, um, like I said, could just be an ideal fit for a book club kit um, or um, other group reading. I also think this one would be have a lot of crossover appeal for teens um, and um, uh, this this is probably my favorite one on my list that I have here, just as a as my own reader. Um, don't forget, we've got other other genres, things like poetry. Um, I included a Mary Oliver anthology here. We uh, everybody knows Mary Oliver. Um, why I picked this one is I think it's one of the most accessible, um, and for people who both people who love poetry and people who are new to poetry. Um, I think that you can jump right in and you can understand it um, and and really get through it in a way that um, that not all poetry and not even all Mary Oliver books um, are written. Um, and Mary Oliver is not an example too of an author that um, some people may be big fans and, and have no idea that 
she um, she identified as a lesbian, um, and um, that I think is is also um, speaks to our earlier conversation about stickering and things like that. Like sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it's great. Just great work. Um, how to love a country? Um, this is um, another accessible, but I would say a little bit. I don't know if I'd use this as somebody's first um, entrance into poetry. Um, but it includes a lot about immigration, gun violence, um, racism. It does speak directly to LGBTQ issues, which is why I included it here. Um, and um, and, and uh, just an, a good, solid um, piece to include in your collection um, if you're looking for a little bit more diversity. And again, a title that speaks to intersectionality. Um, Graphic novels are available really for, for all different ages with queer content. Um, I included How to Be Ace um, because it's a great resource, but also because we haven't talked a lot about other um, asexual resources here. Um, this book is about uh, a character um, navigating her identity and mental health, um, sort of grappling with an asexual identity in a world where sexuality is such a part of, of everything that's presented to us. Um, and it really gives some good insight into how this author identifies as asexual, but also what asexuality means sort of in a bigger, bigger scope. Um, you Brought Me the Ocean is um, a really fun graphic novel that is the origin story for Aqualad. So it's, um, there's sort of some magical realism, some, some comic realism, um, but also a really engaging um, love story. And I think some libraries will have this in teens, some will have it in adult, but this is a book that I would recommend to, to almost anybody. It's, um, it's, it's an exceptional piece from the last few years. So that is uh, what I've prepared. We've got, um, I was hoping to leave 15 minutes for questions. We've got a little less than that, but I'd love to, to hear from folks who may have questions, comments, counterpoints. Yeah, we had a pretty quiet chat overall, um, but I would welcome any questions or comments that people have at this time. Um, Becky pointed out that in that sort of extreme case in Northwest Iowa where there was a book burning, um, they did purchase a digital book. And she says, it's hard to burn a digital copy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I think a lot of what, you're, um, what you've said throughout this presentation is, um, is kind of echoes a lot of what we've heard today. So hearing things about intersectionality and, you know, kind of just do... You can't do everything, um, do one thing or do the thing that's right for your community in whatever small way that that is. Um, so that's that's encouraging. We have another book recommendation here on Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. You know that, I don't know if you know that title. I do know that one, yeah. Yeah, and I, I like that you um, could sort of give us recommendations from across the spectrum and in all those different genres. I know I had not thought about poetry as a place to develop this collection personally. So um, I think that that's um, a great message if someone's building a collection from the ground up too. I mean, don't just buy board books and adult books, um, but have a, a wide range. No, I think it's exciting to find, find these things everywhere. Maybe you could clarify um, if we do have book challenges, how are those reported to ILA? Do you like that, those stats? So I'm not sure about the Iowa Library Association, um, and I would have to check with our with the state library's legal person, and I can send her a message quick to see if that is something we do. I know that you know Mandy Easter, who many of you know from the state library, is always willing to be a resource for folks, um, as is your consultant if you have challenges. Um, of books or programs and um, Stacy brings up in the chat um, 
Uh, having scripts prepared for challenges is something I could use practice with and perhaps other librarians as well. So how, how would you recommend somebody get, you know, do you, can you, should we, should we start role playing with one another? How can we be prepared for that moment when someone slams a book down on the desk and says, I have to talk to you about this? Yeah, I mean, I know we all approach role playing with like a little bit of like a nobody loves it, but it can be really effective in these situations. Um, even the most uh, experienced professional librarian, you know, is going to have that little tinge of doubt when somebody steps forward with a challenge. It's one of those things that very few of us look forward to. Um, but I think. Um, role playing can be a way to make it feel more active and for more for, for real, um, but also just thinking through in the calm moments when you're not facing a challenge, what are the key points that you want to to remind yourself? So when that happens that you don't you don't feel frantic, you feel like okay, I know this, I've got this. I want to make these three points that I will um, I will make sure that I write down the title that's being questioned and the person who's bringing it to me, I'll take their name and contact information. I'll make sure that I, you know, don't overcommit that we're going to pull the resource. I'll make sure that, and it kind of depends to in-person is different than social media and things like that. It can be really hard um, if somebody, you know, makes a comment on your social media about a program or a material not to have a knee-jerk response and either take it down or write something back immediately. But it's okay if you need to take that time to you know, speak to others at your agency, um, figure out what, what's the, the best response um, and come back to it um, you know, as quickly as you can, but it, it might not be immediate. Um, again, these, are not, these aren't different than the other complaints or comments that we might get. Um, they feel a little different, but it's um, it's kind of the same thing as if you know somebody were to come up and complain about a feature of your facility or say that they were treated rudely by a member of your staff. You you know you're going to investigate, you're going to get back to them, but you're not going to promise that you're going to fire somebody. You're not going to promise you're going to pull that book from the collection. Um, and sometimes I've found that people want to be heard more than anything that the really what they wanted to know was that we would take them seriously and that we would we would listen to their concern and they, they may not even really care what happens after that um but having a having a selection policy to go back to um is is always a good thing i also i never i try to to never promise balance in collections i know people feel differently about that um I think that you want to really tap into what your community needs and you don't need to use your resources, which are limited, to buy materials just to quote unquote balance that out. Um, people would disagree with me about that, but that's how I feel. Yeah, no, I think uh, we've had a couple people saying too, um, you know, there's nothing terribly wrong with saying, you know, let me let me look into this and give you a call tomorrow kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the other point I want to make as well is that this is not likely to happen during the director's desk shift, right? So you want to make sure that your staff is, is comfortable and any, anyone on your staff is able to say that, you know, have that let me look into this. Um, or we, we talk often in policies about let me, let me blame the director for this one, um, you know, or like I have to talk with my director, I have to talk with my whoever, um, but that your whole staff is equipped to do that. And um, Rhonda mentions the reconsideration form as well, so that you have something in writing of what their, their specific complaint is about that program, display, um, resource, whatever it is. Um, but I, I think that that's a, a good, a good thing too. Like here's an official way or what feels like an official way for you to, to submit this, this complaint you're, you're, you're bringing to us. And that's a good point. It's always like five fifty-five on a Sunday. Um, yeah. but also, I mean, remember that, that as the library staff, I mean, this is your space, this is your house. So whether it's a per, I mean, Somebody might get in your face and say, I'm, I'm calling the newspaper. I'm, I'm going to film you and put you on social media. I'm going to make this as miserable for you as I can. 
none of that matters. It's this is your your turf. So you can say, you know, again, just stay stay professional, say what you need to say. You know, the the director will be back in their office on Monday. I will make sure that she is available to to reach out to you um, before the end of the day. Again, we don't need to pretend that this is stop everything and, and the director is going to call you at 8.01 on Monday. Nope, but we can try to get her to get back to you that day. Um, and it's, um, I think some of us have experienced this at programs too when somebody will will come to try to make a disruption or um, uh, or you know, local news media might show up kind of thinking, oh, this could go either way. Um, just staying really balanced and not feeding into the frenzy of of a problem, I think will help a lot. Um, and and I know, I mean, I can't speak for everybody's director, but I know that certainly if staff were feeling uncomfortable about something like that, they could they could always reach out to me at home. I mean, I think you, you also probably want to fill out your administration to see um, what what is the situation that you'd like me to call you or, um, you know, get in touch with you on that Sunday afternoon. Um, because you might be surprised at how sort of easygoing folks are about absolutely just give a call. I'm always happy to run in, um, and and we want to to keep that that communication open, but not again. If 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 the library staff starts to get worked up, that's really just going to feed the issue. Yeah, and I want to just point out Lisa had another Lisa in chat had another comment about reconsideration forms, which is you know, maybe you don't want to pull that out right away just because it might give someone some additional um, encouragement to go on to the next level. Um, and so you, you might have to read the situation a little bit or figure out kind of what makes sense. Um, there is a question that came in through the panelists and um, I'll read it out here so everyone can see it. Um, a lot of advice you've given is great for libraries that haven't dipped too far into LGBTQ plus issues. I recently began working in a library and community new to me, and I know there was some fallout between the library and the community on these materials in the past. Would you give the same advice to reintroduce these materials to the community, or would you recommend a different approach? Ooh, I think it kind of depends on maybe some of the details of what the fallout was. Um, I think you'd certainly want to learn from that, from the experience of the folks before you, and try to figure out um, where were the pain points and what what maybe caused the issue in the end. Um, if depending on how much information you can gather that way, um, I think it might be. I mean, I, I like to just go to the source. So if there was a um, if there was I don't know a local group that was very much against having this, I would be tempted to go speak to them and say, I'm new in my position. Um, I've been told some of the history here. Um, we're going to rebuild this collection and and I'm, I'm going to tell you proactively why. Um, you know, not having any idea what size of the community, et cetera, that might not be practical, but um, I think nothing done in secret is going to help in the end. So I certainly wouldn't try to like you know, sneak them in. I think um, you want to be bold. You're doing the right thing. So you want to add them just like you would anything else. But um, again, it's about knowing what your community can can take. So you might decide that your community absolutely doesn't have a problem with them in the collection, but, but whatever you put them in a display, you get pushback. It's better to have them in the collection and not on a display than to not have them at all. Um, so it might be kind of playing that game of finding out, again, where the pain points were, how you can work with that, um, how you can get the community behind you more, um, and and really pick your battles. Um, I think sometimes it, it works well to find a partner who might want to, um, you know, is there a publication in your community that, that it speaks to the queer community that might like, um, a monthly book recommendation from the library or is, are there ways that you can sort of um, weave into other organizations so that if you if somebody does question it they're sort of already facing two groups um, you know it just depends on what your resources are I I'm I'm a big believer in just process it talk it out um, see what we can get to 
but I also have enough experience with it that I, I feel very comfortable dealing with those challenges. Um, it might, it kind of depends where, where folks are in, in that comfort as well. Um, I think it's, it's okay to take time too. If you, especially if you're newer in a position, newer in a community, um, I think it's awesome if this was a priority, it'd be a priority for me too. Um, but if it makes more sense to maybe get a couple other projects started as you feel the, feel the context of your, your new place out, um, that's not a failure at all. That's sort of due diligence as well. Um, and I also think if you've already had some feather ruffling, you might want to work out with, um, I don't know what level of staff this person is, but with the board or with um, the director or with the rest of the staff, kind of what will your approach be if the same thing happens again? Can you, can you put anything in place proactively that would simplify that process? Um, but it's um, another, I, I think another way to, to approach this is to take a step back from LGBTQ and to just talk about diversity. And sometimes when you wrap this into diversity lens, um, it feels different to people. Like it feels more of a part of a whole and less of a whatever misconstrued attack of American values somebody might think it is. Um, and I hope that we're a place where most communities would welcome um, at least the idea of working towards a more diverse collection. Um, and really everything that I talked about today could be could be incorporated into um, a general diversity audit of collections. Um, and that's, I know that's something that's really growing in popularity. Um, so if you needed to, to wrap it in a little bit bigger box, um, I would probably use that diversity framework um, and and you, the, the added benefit to that is you'll also learn more about what other diversity areas you could grow. Yes, um, I, think, I think that's great. We are coming here to the top of the hour too. And I know we've had, um, we've had some folks in chat kind of giving each other some helpful advice and kind of what you're saying about engaging with community um, and doing that sort of slowly recognizing that this is, is um, this is a huge topic that you're not going to solve overnight and uh, being willing to do the hard, slow work is an important thing. Um, so I'm going to stop our recording.